graduation programs, and I would like to introduce our panel. Our topic today is Beyond the Surface, Beyond Policies, the Underlying Concern, and this is to explore the experience of women in athletics and recreation. I'm very excited to introduce for the second year in a row, Dr. Nancy Lowe, coming to us from UNLV. Uh, she's turning into an ISS staple, so we're very excited to have some here. And in no particular order, because they didn't sit in order, I'm just going to read off my list here, with, uh, this is just a whole bunch of professional awesomeness coming on here um, from the University of Colorado. It is a word. Um, we've got Skillberry, Alexis Williams, M.T. Eisner, Lindsay Liu, Mackenzie Altman, and representing CD Recreation Services, Tony Price.
I'd like to elaborate a little bit on what Alexis said. Uh, this whole perception that if you're a girl or you're a woman um, and you play sports, then you're probably gay. And it's not just that you're probably gay, the perception that that's bad, that that's a negative. Um, as opposed to you're probably straight, that's a positive, you're probably gay. And how damaging that is to a high school kid or a college kid that it puts you in this uh, pool of people that are uh, immoral or not religious or you know something, something that's a uh, perception of being negative. And, and I think that causes behaviors from girls, for example, choosing sports uh, based on, let's suppose you're tall. Um, the perception of basketball being a sport where more, more of the gay women play and volleyball being a sport that's a little more feminine or gymnastics, the feminine sport, and soccer, maybe not the feminine sport. And so I think it impacts kids and their decisions, um, also their social decisions. Um, I, I, I can distinctly remember having kids on my team who were sexually active as freshmen and sophomore because they wanted to prove to their teammates that they're straight. And uh, so they're out uh, you know, participating in behaviors uh, that were so damaging. And I, I can remember having a kid in my office, you know, kind of, what's, what, you know, when so-and-so thinks I'm gay and how horrified she was. And so it's not just that the perception is that it's a really bad thing. Stereotypes can be very dangerous, um, but here's another one. <laughs> Work-life balance is a growing challenge. Women who are balancing being a mother with a career are assumed to be less committed to their work, despite research that shows women are as committed or even more so than men to their work and career. What issues have you had to overcome related to work-life balance, and how do you handle the second shift, meaning the work it takes to raise children and maintain a family life? I'm Lindsay. I have two married and have two little boys. They're not little boys. They're 10 and 6. Um, but I've worked here for kind of upwards of 20 years, so I've been here basically since I was a graduate student. Um, you know, a lot of the, the issues that we have to overcome are from the people that really don't maybe understand what our work ethic is or um, kind of what we're capable of. Um, for me, it, you know, it, it changed. I can't tell you how much it changes. It's not. It's not something that I can even articulate. But um, my kids go to school at night, and school is out at 3:40. So before school and after school, there's things we have to figure out. The job that I do, which is I um, oversee our digital and database group, so that's the website, that's social media, that's email. That that job isn't a nine-to-five job. That job is a. It's a 24/7, 365 job. And so. A, I have a husband who is awesome. My trophy husband is super supportive and understands. He knew what he was getting into when he dated me because I already worked here and I wasn't going anywhere. Um, and so he, we both love sports, so that's obviously um, part of why I'm here. But um, you can't approach you can't approach your day the same as everybody else does and doesn't have those responsibilities because my kids tend to he has no business taking care of himself like that's not going to happen right now. Um, we're really lucky, I think, with both with the people that have been my direct manager, Matt Biggers, and then before him, Tom Ann, and then Rick, our athletic director, is they get it. And they have been really open to understanding that I don't I don't have a clock punching job. I can't. It's just it can't be that way because if I treated it that way, there are so many things that wouldn't get done after five o'clock before eight o'clock in the morning if, if that was how we had to approach our job. So I think that um, just we have to evolve in this industry to understand that for, we, we have to have babies, like um, nobody else can do it. Um, <laughs> and so it, there we are, I really feel like we have acceptance and flexibility to do that job, but I, I better crush it. Like I, I put the pressure on myself that if, that if I'm gonna require some of that latitude and some of the help, I better do an awesome job and I better communicate and be transparent and be a great teammate and I think that that is the challenge. I mean, I would hope that everybody is trying to give their best, but I feel like I get I have to do more a lot of the time, and especially for a period of time. I was the only one that had little kids. 
there were uh, women that had kids that were older, um, but from the group of women that I was here with, everybody that got pregnant and had kids would go on maternity leave and then they would not come back. There were four years where I was the only one that had a baby in state. And that, that's a, a heavy burden to carry. Thank you, MCU, for joining the club. There's a lot of people on the club now that are in this room right now. Um, but, you know, I, I, it was never an option for me to go as far as I was concerned, but um, the people in our organization that support what we do is a huge difference maker. Like, you have to make a commitment and communicate with the women in your team that if that's something that they're going to do, hopefully they're already valued on your team and you want them to stay. So tell them that you want them to stay and be willing to work with them to help them to do that. And know that they're going to be super loyal to you and work really hard because you've uh, shown them that loyalty and given them that opportunity. Um, so speaking on the kids thing, I'll speak on kids and spouses actually. Um, I have two children, I have a two-year-old and a one-year-old. I would not recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> two kids in two years. Um, it was a gem of a time that we've had. Um, I, I would say the work-life balance aspect of it, um, coming from a coaching aspect where you do talk a lot throughout the day, because I'm coaching, um, to have to then go home and have no reprieve. That's actually where I've had the biggest struggle in terms of just finding time for myself. Um, yes, we're, we're here 10, 12, 14 hour days depending on what we're doing, but going home and like, you just kind of want that like half an hour to sit on the couch, turning on something stupid on TV or whatever, and zoning out for a little bit. Um, but I come home and I don't, there's plenty of days I actually don't see my kids at all, um, which is extremely depressing, but when you come home and you have to be on, your spouse has had the child, or your, your children, a good amount for that day and they're ready to hand them over. Um, right? You, it, it's it's like being it. on again for your children, and I think that, that can be difficult because they don't know what your day was like, and they don't need to know what my day was like at this age. Um, so, you know, in regards to the actual, my job with kids, um, CU has been extraordinarily supportive, and I, I can't say enough about that. Um, if I need to bring my children to work, I can. I, can, I coached every Friday for a full year with a child on my chest, and my coaches were super um, welcoming of it, they loved it. My athletes loved having the kids around in the weight room. My supervisors were very supportive of that. So it's really wonderful to have that option, but it's not ideal as um, anybody who has children knows. But I would say the other thing with work-life balance, um, my husband and I both play Division I sports, and he still, for the life of him, cannot figure out what I do. Uh, and I think that's what gets really frustrating, is, is the, um, you know, I'm in season right now with three of my teams, and I started in November, that forewarning of, hey, my weekends are no longer our weekends. My weekends are, um, I'm at games, so I'm doing on Saturdays, I'm at practices. Um, you know, these are allowances we need to make. He coaches as well, um, on top of his own job, but he coaches hockey, so he travels, but that understanding of my job, um, can get really frustrating for him, um, you know, and just in transparency, we have a, like a huge blow up fight like two weeks ago over, once again, a job that I've been doing for seven, eight years now in terms of like, I don't understand why your commitment is so great in various aspects of the year and we have two kids, don't they know that? Yes, they do. My coaches do. I can bring them, but that doesn't matter. Like, it's, and so I think it's just in general like a work life, um, you know, I'll, I don't think a work-life balance is actually even a thing that exists. You have a life and you work. <laughs> um, so I'm Mackenzie. I work in a fundraising arm and currently I'm the only female fundraiser. And um, my counter to this is I am single and it is very difficult to date um, in this industry just for the fact that um, I'm, around, I'm around sports 24-7, um, but I'm also at events all the time. So I am the women's basketball liaison. So um, it is recommended that I am at every single one of their home games. I also currently travel with them. So that's four days that I'm currently on the road with them. And then I also have to attend all the men's basketball games and then everything that's related to football, any other event that's associated with that. And so it is very difficult to date someone and have them understand um, that it is part of my job. And so it's very difficult for a work-life balance. And um, I feel at times because I do not have a significant other and I don't have children, that I tend to pick up the slack per se of those that have to go and attend to their significant others or their family. So then I'm expected to be at all the other events um, and to represent the, the Buff Club. And 
um, you know, kind of what the student athletes were saying in regards to mental health. Like, I definitely need my own time, and I can kind of relate to Gabby because I feel like I'm on 110% of the time, and um, I'm always now we're facing. Um, you know, I'm always representing CU and no matter what I do, and that's at any event. So if I'm even eating dinner at Pasta Jays with my family, people are gonna recognize me and I feel like I'm always representing CU. And so um, I think it is difficult to have that work-life balance. And um, I definitely think sometimes um, there are some standards that I can't say, hey, I gotta go take care of my kids. So then I'm expected to be at all of those events. And it gets kind of exhausting and it's stressful. And it's just I constantly have to keep proving myself, I feel like, at those events, like every time I attend it. So um, I think maybe Alexis could kind of speak to that as well. But it's difficult to be single and to um, have a work-life balance and you know try and um, not attend all of the events. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with Mackenzie. She and I talk about this a lot. I, and that kind of goes back to the first question of the stereotype. But I think people feel single people don't need a work-life balance. Because you're single. You don't have kids to run home to. You don't have a spouse to run home to. So, hey, you can come with this. Or, hey, you can help out with this. So, yeah, I think that's a, a stereotype that's there, that single people don't need work-life balance. Or it's just assumed that we will be at everything. So why, why did I see you at the game the other day? It's not, why well, I need a real party. It's just like, you don't have anything. Why, why weren't you there? Or where are you? So I uh, agree with McKinsey 100% on that. I'll speak to her. Yeah, so I'm here as an ally of, of women in sport, but really for my personal experience, when my parents divorced at a young age, um, my dad actually moved to Boulder, and, and my mom and I, and my sister lived in Iowa City, Iowa. And my mom had to pack up to Ames, Iowa, to get a master's in, in education. So she's going to school full time. She's teaching full time um, at a high school, and she's commuting two hours a day. And then in her spare time, she's cooking at the local frat house. And so <laughs> she didn't have any work-life balance. It was strictly survival. How am I going to take care of my kids? How am I going to um, pr prepare for the future? And so seeing that type of drive and commitment from a woman was a great model for me. And I want to follow up with you, Tony, in particular, because one of the things that happens in this space is men are celebrated for being fathers, right? Oh, he's such a good guy. Look, he's taking care of his children. What a wonderful role model. And yet then women are questioned, right, about your commitment um, when you have a family to take care of and when you have that second ship. So I'm going to pick on you a little bit, being the only guy on the panel. Can you address why, why you think that might be from a gender perspective? It's just classic old school gender roles that we have in society, and, and those roles are hard to break, and I think we're, we're evolving and changing those roles, but again, um, those are traditions in our society that have been around for, for years, and, and how do we break those traditions down? And I think it's conversations like this, it's how do we build it in our curriculum um, within the classes that our students take, and, and more forward-facing around change. And, um, I have two young kids, and I'm very active with my children, and, and I don't know how I couldn't do it without the support of my wife. And so for any, any single parent, it's just amazing uh, how they get it done. Can I, sorry, can I jump on that real fast? Um, to your question, of, or your question to Tony, um, I heard this down as well. The stereotype of, I, I'm a mom now, and I know this is gonna sound really helpful, I can't stand that. That, that's the first thing that people ask me now every single time I see them, um, is no longer like, hey, MT, how are you? I don't know. <laughs> um, but the very first thing that I get asked all the time is, how are the kids? How are the kids? How are the kids? And flipping around and trying to listen to if those same conversations are happening with the men in my office is not the same. Um, they don't get asked, how are their kids, as the very first thing. And I love my kids. I love talking about them. I don't want to talk about them. No? And I had a life before they were here, and I have a life now without my children. And I think that's a really important um, aspect of just being, you know, an individual. Like, yes, I'm married. Yes, I have children. But I'm also a strength coach. I'm also, a, you know, a human being. I'm also a former athlete. I have all these other identities as well. Um, and becoming a mom, I lost every identity other than just being a mom. Um, and for me, I've, I've been kind of trying to stick around that one a little bit. Sorry. <laughs> Pro tip, if a dad is washing his own children, it's not babysitting. It's just parenting. <laughs> Nobody asks me if I'm babysitting my kids. <laughs> I will correct you, by the way. <laughs> okay, 
Okay, moving on. Um, we would often face invisible barriers like the glass ceiling or what we call occupational closure, or certain positions are simply not available because you're a woman. Do you have examples where this occurred in your career or it happened to friends or colleagues? And if so, how did you navigate the challenge or what strategies have you seen other women use? Thank you. Um, and she's the first female strength coach I've ever heard of that worked with football in 20 years of this and playing a college sport. So I, I think there, there are certainly a concept that, that maybe exists, but I see the most connect on certain issues. And so um, I kind of have seen that throughout my career where um, a male counterpart would receive a promotion a lot quicker than I may have received a promotion, even though my metrics might be a little bit higher or I have proved myself in other ways. And so I'm starting to see it in there. I'm still very young in my career, um, but I have been able to see that since I have graduated from college. Well, I think everybody knows I've been here, and I said this last year at this event, uh, that when I came here, it, I was the only female who was not a secretary. And then Leanne came, and uh, maybe three years later. And um, so I've seen women hired, promoted, and it's you know it, it, it's hard for me not to be optimistic. However, to to reach uh, the boardroom and the decision making, that's still a bit of a club. And what. Uh, access do you have for information for high level decision making? I think that's in your next question. Uh, you know, that's that's still based on relationships and when leadership, um, I think during my 37 year tenure here, uh, we, we have had two female presidents, uh, Betsy Hoffman and I forgot the name of the Judith Alpina, and, uh, but never a, female chancellor or a female athletic director. And so uh, women tend to be out of the loop on certain decisions that are, that are important decisions. And uh, oftentimes those tend to be budget related, you know, follow the money, because that's where, that's where big decisions are. So, you know, I, I think when you're in our roles, you have to be optimistic and forward facing if you're a female, because if you can, you're not going to get very far if you're negative and pessimistic. Um, and so you, you recognize the, process, the progress, uh, yet have to be visionary on what true equity really looks like. And I think women have, have that vision more so um, because they're not there. They're not at that table. I would say, too, that just within student affairs and collegiate recreation, it's different than collegiate athletics. I've, just from my own personal observation, I've seen opportunities for women to advance in, in leadership positions within collegiate rec, um, definitely within student affairs around you know, vice president, vice chancellor. And so there's gaps um, within collegiate athletics for sure around administration. Um, but again, from my personal experience, um, student affairs creates a pathway for a number of underrepresented populations to have an opportunity to advance um, in leadership roles. And I'll, I'll speak to that. Uh, I work in ticketing, so I oversee our ticketing sales and ops, and definitely across college athletics, this is something you normally see males leading the department. Um, I am just the second female in CU's history to hold this spot. Uh, Caitlin's mom was the first. Um, I will say my counterparts in the Pac-12 are all males, except for at one other school. That, that hold this title. And my staff, our, our staff here at CU, probably we have more females than any other staff in, other than myself. It's Steph, Alexandra, and on the sales side, um, Marissa. So it is very much a male-dominated thing, but I, I think the biggest thing is when you get here to help those behind you. So. You know, I try to mentor those on my staff, those who have left, where I say, Cassie leave, I still talk to her a lot. So I think, and this kind of leads to another question you have later, but I think as females, instead of waiting for somebody to come ask you to let them mentor you, we should be more assertive of one, find a uh, female mentor. Um, still is great. I meet with her once a month. And, really is just on professional development and she's been doing this 
this for a long time. So why not go see and find somebody to be a mentor for you that is a female and gets it? So, so yeah, the next question is related. And the Good Old Boys Network or Club is still a factor in sport, as you all have identified. We often see men given access to key information by engaging with other men outside of work, doing things like playing golf. This can lead to an advantage for these men when a position comes open so they have access to information. Have you had experiences where you felt you were ready for a promotion or were seeking a new opportunity, but you were passed over despite being highly qualified? And if so, what, what explanations were you given for why you were passed over? Or you can always talk about some colleague as well, not necessarily just your own personal experience. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Um, I, I was going to get a promotion at one point just before anybody that's in leadership roles here was here. Um, I was pregnant, and one day I had a promotion, and then the next day I didn't. And it was going to happen when I came back from maternity leave. And I'm still, still waiting. I'm not. It's a different, it's a different role. But that, <laughs> that actually was illegal, which I didn't know. I, I really didn't. Um, again, I can't say enough about our, the leadership that we have now between CEO and Rick and, and my boss Matt, um, and that was the explanation. Well, you know, you'll need some time. All true. Still totally legal. Just in case you're wondering, you can't deny a person a promotion on the basis of pregnancy. Um, so that stunk, but I sure as heck learned from it, and I know a lot more about what's required in terms of you know protecting class stuff. I learned a lot from that experience, but um, not that I can tell from the other stuff. I don't think that was kind of the only thing. It was a bad one, but that's the only one. Um, Kizzy will, I think, speak to this as well with the, the golf part, right? Um, college athletics, golf is a big thing here at CU, and our athletic department is one of our biggest fundraisers. Um, but you look around, and how many females have been asked to be on these teams when we have these scrambles to represent the athletic department? Uh, a lot of times, the males on staff will take Friday afternoon or Friday and go play golf. How many times have a female been invited to this? So that speaks to that good old boys club. Um, how many of you been, have we thought to ask females since we know, as the whole saying goes, you know, this is done on the golf course. How about some professional development? Do we know even if everybody on the staff knows how to play golf? Um, I was fortunate enough uh, to be a part of an institute for um, administrative advancement for women leaders in college sports. And believe it or not, that was a piece of it. Part of our session was they arranged time with golf pros, so people were split up. Those who know how to play, okay, you can go to the driving range or go play a few holes. Those who don't, okay, we're pairing you with some golf pros and they taught you basics. So again, when we talk about that, a lot of times, good old boy network of that or it's just enough to say oh we have women on staff you know so it is good so uh, Dallas Mavericks CEO Cynthia Marshall is a female one of the first in the NBA but recently at a conference she, she made a statement that diversity is being invited to a party but inclusion is being asked to dance mm -hmm. so the question is are the males or are other people inviting us to dance or is it just enough that Oh, we got females on staff, so they're, they're good, but are we being invited to these other things, or are we really being invited to be included, or is it just, we're good, we got females on staff, we don't need to invite them to dance, per se, so, I, I, you know, I would say that about that question. Um, in regards to the golf, um, I, <laughs> I tend to see this often because a lot of times um, you're going to have a donor meeting out on the golf course, and um, I am the first to admit I suck at golf. Um, I'm pretty athletic, um, but I have a I have a short game. I can you know chip and putt, um, but I cannot drive the ball, and it's very frustrating. Um, but I will say this is um, I did have an opportunity, and I asked if I could join the donor um, on a golf course, and I just sat with him. And I said I would say that that was probably more productive than me actually playing the game because I got to relate to him and ask him questions and say, hey, why are you picking this club or why are you doing that? And a big thing in fundraising is people give to people, and I truly believe that. And I think just me learning about what he was doing and just 
uh, wanting to be a forever learner and just being open and honest and being like, yeah, I'm terrible at this game. I would love to play with you, but I still want to enjoy this experience. But a counter to that too is, um, you know, sometimes I feel like I can have the same meeting with the donor in an hour that, you know, somebody could have in four hours and I can still get the job done. Um, and I can still, you know, have the have it, and it can be like in a coffee shop. It doesn't need to be a four-hour meeting, and I'm still getting my job done and still being productive. And kind of to speak to what Alexis says, um, I would love if we were offered the opportunity for professional development to learn the game of golf. I mean, it is. We have an amazing Gate Ten. I mean, we were, I was part of the fundraising to raise for the Gate Ten experience, and it is amazing. And I would love the opportunity, Coach. Um, <laughs> I love it. All right, tomorrow. <laughs> um, but I think it would be a great bonding experience too, just for the women to get together and like take us out and like laugh and giggle, but like teach us how to play golf because it is such an important aspect of it. And I know um, professional development is like in here in conferences and conventions and all of that, but I would like an active professional development. And I think learning to play golf would be a huge um, benefit just for everybody in general. It really advanced um, a, a number of my opportunities. Um, I like the, the comment. This really isn't about golf. Um, it, it's about sharing information. Yeah. And I mean, because you go learn how to play golf and spend time with me and Kelly and get on the course and, and come off the course five hours later and still have zero information. It's about um, why is the information not being shared? Is it that? the guys don't trust you to give you the information. And why wouldn't they trust you to give you, if, if the guys trust you with the information, they must think you're um, good at evaluating what to share with others and what to keep to yourself. There's also the threat for the guys of uh, if they know this or if they turn on me, um, I'm could conceivably be reported to OIEC. Um, you know, uh, we're in a stressful job. You know, the, you know, I was a female coach coaching female athletes. I think males coaching female athletes have, have some uh, parameters that make it difficult. Uh, but if, if you look in the office space, if, uh, I'll use my boss, Rick, he's under, tremendous stress. He runs a $90 million operation. If he needs to blow off steam, he can choose me or Lance and or uh, or any of the other guys. Let's say he chooses Lance. Lance probably is, cannot make a gender uh, complaint against Rick because they're both guys. So he can't go and say, you know, to the office of, if I don't handle that information accurately, and maybe he's blowing off steam at me because I missed something. And and you know, is there that threat? And so I'm not I'm not giving I'm not saying it's an excuse, but I, I think we all need to be as women be accountable for information. We're in highly sensitive uh, positions when you're uh, dealing with student athletes. So I think we have to ask the question: Well, if we're not getting information, is it is, why are we not getting information? Uh, and in, in, in that when we do get information, that we're keeping that information and looking at the business from a high level and, and understanding, well, well, who gets that? Because your person next door in your office, now you have that information, and it might be a woman, and you're not sharing it with her. Now it's not a gender issue. It's an information issue. Because, and you're not sharing it with her because you don't trust what she will do or he will do and it has nothing to do with gender. So I, I just wanted to raise that uh, as a thought. Uh, circling back around on the promotion um, and seeking new opportunities, and I think this isn't a male versus woman thing, it's more of a athletics thing. Um, I, you know, working in athletics in general, the common stereotype or joke is long hours, not a lot of pay. Um, and the amount of times that I've been told in throughout my entire professional career or other stream coaches or other people working in athletics, in order to get a promotion, in order to get paid more money, you need to go somewhere else. And for me, that is a huge issue. If I am doing a good job with a place that I'm currently working and they don't want to lose me, why will they not? 
pay me what another university will. And I have been told countless times, go get another offer and bring it back and we'll see what we can do. I don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and that's, that's an athletics thing. That's not a woman thing, that's not a man thing. That's, that's a, something I think in, in general we all kind of face in terms of um, the constant idea of if you have talent you want to keep, keep it and, and, and help them. And it's not much, it doesn't take much to make, um, the research shows that it doesn't take much to make people want to stay in an organization financially um, or work-life balance or whatever aspects that those could be, um, but making a difference every year, every couple of years, every now and then, it makes, it makes a big difference in terms of trying to keep the people that you want to keep at home here rather than the revolving door that athletics tends to be, which is unfortunate. Um, but it's unfortunate for the student athletes um, most importantly, the amount of times I've seen athletes are upset because a coach leaves for a better job, um, it affects them and it, and it affects their ability to be the best that they can get their sport. They're choosing a commitment here for four years. Why can't we do the same? And I hear that a lot from my athletes. So just kind of circling back on that. So Seal touched on a, a very important concept, the concept of trust. Um, and I think whenever we have these conversations around especially women in leadership or the underrepresentation, one of the things that typically comes right in front of us time and time again is what we call blame the woman, right? So a lot of these issues are women's issues, or that's how they're labeled, right? Childcare is a women's issue. Um, this notion of whether men can trust women or women can trust men always comes about actually to be a women's issue as opposed to a men's issue. And when we talk about inclusion, the thing that I think we need to be mindful of is it's not just a woman's issue, right? This is how we are going to move forward towards having more inclusive um, environments and cultures in which everyone thrives in, in a better way, a more powerful and meaningful and purposeful way. Having said that, most of this has kind of been directed at things that men could do or improve the circumstances for women, right? So I'm gonna turn the tables a little bit. Women who aspire to leadership positions in sport often experience what we call a double-edged sword. For example, men often assist young men in advancing, that's the bro code, whereas some women act as the queen bee, and this is well established, preventing other women from advancing. In fact, it's so well established that Madeleine Albright has one of my favorite quotes. She said, there's a special place in hell for women who don't support other women. That's right. Um, so, how, have, first of all, have you witnessed this phenomenon or experienced it? And how do we get um, yeah, men more active in becoming allies for women, actively working to help them advance? And in particular, if you've experienced the Queen Bee Syndrome, is there any justification or reason for it? Yes. <laughs> yes, I've experienced it. Um, we, she sent us these questions ahead of time, and so some of us kind of got together and talked about why does that happen? Um, 10 to 10 minute warning. <laughs> um, you know, I started out answering phones and sports information and worked for Phil Berry as a student SID and then a full time SID, and I have grinded and worked my tail off to get every opportunity that I have had here. Um, there have been women that have, that have helped me along the way, but there are women who have actively tried to stop that. I don't know if essentially is the right word, but I'm just going to use that word. Um, and I, I can't figure out why. I can't figure out if it's because they themselves also worked hard and know women helped them along the way and they are so afraid of losing the clout or the job or the, I, don't, I don't know what it is. It's so trash. You guys, we can't behave like that. We have to lift each other up. And men who are allies, if you, it's not hard to see when it's happening because you are often participating in the conversation. And you, you may not even realize what's happening, but um, it's, it's sneaky, it's pretty sciencey. Like it's, it's never something that is overt, I don't feel like. Um, but I put, a, I put a stop to it when I, when I see it happen. I mean, it's one of those things where you don't go, you're being a queen bee and you're not woman helping women. Like that's not how you intervene in that situation, but you can see who the victim of the situation is or who the person that is being kind of held down, and you can help them. Like you can choose to be a mentor, um, but don't think it does that this does not happen because it happens. Um, and especially women who are in leadership roles in our department, like it is our responsibility. You have to find people to look out for, and you need to be aware of when this stuff is happening. 
because um, women are talented, we're half the population, we're pretty smart, we have a lot to offer. Um, there's nothing to be afraid of. There really isn't. Um, I think a lot of times that it is a person's own insecurity that's causing this to happen. And um, you can't control that, you can control how you respond to it. 